Appreciate that security culture. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, We're really happy that everybody is here. Uh, this promises to be a very exciting uh, conversation among active people around the question of housing and homelessness. Uh, <clears throat> we got a great program scheduled for you this afternoon. And we want to start out by uh, acknowledging the land on which we are, which we are occupying. So I want to say that a land acknowledgement is to recognize the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. It involves reflection on the longstanding history of the land, which brings each of us to this space. Although we're not meeting in person, it's still important to acknowledge that we in Chicago occupy unceded land that is part of the traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations who were forcibly removed from this land in the 19th century. Other tribes, including the Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Miami, Sauk, and Fox also consider this region home and other native people from diverse tribes, in part due to Chicago's role as forced relocation destinations in the 1950s, <clears throat> have called and continue to call Chicago home. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations. Today, there are over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois, and one of the largest urban American Indian communities in the US resides in Chicago. Members of this community continue to contribute to the life of the city and celebrate their heritage, practice traditions, and care for the land and waterways. For millennia, the waterways of the Great Lakes have been critical resources for fishing, agriculture, and transport, which Native communities have continually cared for and worked to protect. Amen. Thank you for uh, that, Lou. Um, Thank you. I think it's important uh, also to just to uh, I don't I don't think we have to add anything to the voiceover uh, on the etiquette for behaving here, but we do want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to talk who wants to. The way in which we're going to organize this session or this this program may be a little different than we've done in the past, but one thing is that we want each of the uh, people were identifying as panelists or presenters to be able to talk for up to five minutes about what their struggles are about. So we'll call on them individually to make a statement and then have some conversation among the people who are, who are panelists to respond to each other, to ask each other questions, however that works out. And at that point, we'll have a break. Now, there are a number of us who are here who are also involved in the arts. And so, <clears throat> for example, Andrew is a poet. Uh, Adam is a musician and a poet. His who is a poet. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll have kind of an interchange. Eric is a poet. We'll have kind of interchange of poetry as we, as we uh, kind of break to, to consider and think about the discussion that took place before and look at it from a poetic standpoint. And then we'll come back and open it up to everybody who's in, the, uh, in, in, the, <clears throat> in this meeting, the uh, 20 or more people who are here to be able to talk uh, and discuss the, the question that we have before us, the question of housing, the question of homelessness, the question of tenants' rights, all, all kinds of issues that are brought up here. Um, so um, I, we don't want to take a whole lot of time, long introductions, but what we do want to do is ask everybody to introduce themselves a little bit to begin with to talk about, uh, about uh, your, the work that you've been doing and, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the work that you've been doing. Um, so let's start off, if we could, um, with Andrew from uh, Las Vegas. Would you like to start us off, please? 
that's it. Just an introduction, like a quick yeah, one. Yeah, introduction okay. and, and what you've been doing. Okay, uh, my name's Andrew Romanelli. I live in Las Vegas. Uh, I work with a, a group called New Leaf Community. Um, we work directly with uh, the homeless to provide uh, housing for them um, by ways of uh, Conestoga Hut shelters. And, uh, and anything you'd like to say in terms of the, you know, the activity that's going on there in Vegas? Uh, we're constantly running into problems with the city and the police who actively go after our efforts. Um, that's our, our biggest, biggest problem right now. Common problem everywhere. Um, Bonnie, would you like to give us a few words about uh, the work that you're doing? Yes. Hi, my name is Bonnie. I am the president of the Chicago Union of the Homeless. And I go out and I talk with homeless communities and try to see what they want besides just getting housed. Cool. Uh, Adam, do you want to take the next group? Um, sure. Well, I, I think we're going to go to Tom uh, next. Um, cool. So uh, yeah, Tom, can you just introduce yourself and you can say a little bit about uh, the various, uh, you know, um, efforts that you're involved in. You mean everything I'm involved in. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm considered the mayor of Uptown Ten City, which we changed the doors apart in 2017. We came back in 2000. 19 took over the bridges. It is now Uptown Homeless Community. I am the mayor. I am vice president of the Chicago Union of Homeless. I'm hooked up with several organizations out here, and we're fighting for housing, affordable housing, low income housing. And we're fighting the crooked aldermen of our areas. Work. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm so glad you're here, um, uh, both you and Bonnie uh, in particular, and uh, homies and comrades from Chicago. Uh, and I'm super excited to meet some folks who I haven't met yet uh, today. Um, Taylor from Kalamazoo, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I am Taylor. Uh, I use she or they pronouns. Um, so I am from Kalamazoo. Um, I've been involved in community organizing um, for a little over two years. Um, I'm a part of the Kalamazoo chapter of Food Not Bombs. Um, so we make and share meals, uh, clothing and essentials with the community, uh, which involves many of our unhoused neighbors. Uh, we set up at a local park here and um, uh, have also previously delivered to downtown and uh, encampments um, before many of them were dispersed or swept. Um, in winter months, uh, community organizers across different collectives have crowdfunded for hotel stays for people who are sleeping outside. Um, and uh, about a year ago, myself and others um, planned for the build and installation of a community fridge and pantry, um, which was outside of a grocery store. Um, this was, this acted as like a food hub, uh, or a hub for food essential items, um, a charging station, and a shelter for some in the colder months. Um, it was a good spot for resources and for pe people to just gather and be in community together. Uh, unfortunately, um, we were asked to move this fridge from that area. Um, so that is being moved to a different spot, um, which is um, definitely a sad situation um, for those who are utilizing um, the fridge in that area. Um, and in Kalamazoo, we're seeing an influx of sweeps over the last couple of years. Um, this is not a new issue. It just seems that the city is trying to push the houseless further and further out of the city limits. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you for uh, those updates and uh, info. Um, yeah. Uh, 
yeah sorry to hear of those um those recent um yeah uh attacks or or setbacks or however we want to call that um really glad you're here taylor um and uh feel free to you know turn your camera on uh whenever if you can and if you can't of course no worries uh we understand um and thanks for sharing your pronouns of course everyone can share the pronouns too um when you introduce yourself uh next up um, we have from Union to End Slums, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, Ifengi. Um, please correct me if I'm not saying it right. And uh, I got a note that we're having some tech troubles. Are you able to hear us and speak to us, Ifengi? Yes and yes. Okay, please introduce yourself. Or was that a yes to having tech troubles? <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Well, uh, um, we can come back to you if you're able to troubleshoot. Wonderful. Um, I, I hope we can uh, get you uh, to be able to join by audio um, soon. Um, uh, for now, if you want to briefly introduce you yourself in the chat and Union to End Slums um, in Chicago, um, you can uh, do so in the chat, maybe, uh, and we can read that out loud. Um, uh, just a couple more panelists left, but I also want to mention that uh, we want to make space uh, during our time today for everyone to uh, speak to hear from as many folks as possible. Uh, Taylor mentioned Food Not Bombs. I know we have some folks from Food Not Bombs here in Chicago as well on the call with us. I'm really excited to um, hear from everyone's experience. Um, next up on my list I'm looking at is Patrick um, from Chicago, uh, involved in a, a lot of efforts related to housing. Um, uh, do you want to introduce yourself, Patrick? Hey, hey everyone, I'm Patrick. Um, I, yeah, help um, with efforts um, along with you and Bonnie and Tom um, with the Chicago Union of the Homeless. Um, and yeah, that's all I'll say for now. Awesome, thank you. And then uh, Sarah is with us from San Francisco and first they came for the homeless. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, uh, I'm kind of a veteran of the homeless union, um, was helping organize the original uh, homeless union, national, uh, branch of the National U Homeless Union in 1987. Um, we were pretty militant here in San Francisco. Um, I've been with um, Food Not Bombs. I worked with Food Not Bombs uh, here um, uh, with um, various uh, homes out jails. I was a founding member of that. We did housing takeovers. That was in the past. I'm not so much active on the street level now, but we did have a very active um, in the Bay Area. It, it was also in San Francisco and the East Bay. Um, I, uh, came out of Occupy, which was actually um, held down by a lot of street people here, a lot of them young street artists too. And um, when they finally broke that up, we uh, did some other activities. And then myself and the homeless leader, Mike Zant, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, a little before COVID hit, he had, he had lung disease. But um, very militant uh, camp, camp based moving, um, you know, occupations, you would say. Um, and he did a lot of writing and a lot of organizing. And, and um, he passed away, conditions changed. Right now, my main activity of the, the you know, the situation here in San Francisco is terrible. They, they've run a lot of the poor and working people out of the city. They attacking independent campsites. They had a couple of, they put some people in hotels during COVID. I don't know what's going to happen, you know, now that supposedly they're out of danger. Um, uh, so there isn't a lot of homeless-led organizing going on here, but we've got terrible rents. 
we've got very bad rents that have gone up. So we've got a very developed gentrification here. Um, so right now I'm mainly putting my efforts into being uh, a on the editorial board of the People's Tribune, some of you may not may be uh, familiar. I see a heart, and um, I'm on the homeless desk. So we really want to get the voices of the people who are like yourselves, who are on the front lines, who are organizing, who are writing photographs. So I'm going to do a commercial here for that. So I'm putting I'm putting a lot of my efforts into getting uh, across the country the stories of the people who really, like yourselves, are on the front line and resisting and organizing. So that's my commercial break. That's great. That's very that's great. Good to hear. Thank you, Sarah. I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad to hear, uh, hear you give a recap of all the work that you've been involved with. One of the things that I remember well is uh, uh, you're getting arrested for fe feeding the homeless. They so, took me to court for it, actually. Yeah. yeah. Went off for six months. <laughs> but so, yeah, they, they don't want anybody to be, well, you know, and we politicize this too, but they don't want anyone to be free of their methods of controlling people. In other words, just for people to help each other and say there's, there's enough food, why is anyone hungry? There's enough housing, why is anybody homeless? So that's what that was about. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's cool. Kind of what I'd like to do though, is I'd like to hear um, also from Tom talking about uh, the Bring Chicago Home campaign. Yeah, uh, Tom uh, has probably a number of uh, fronts of struggle he can report on. Are you still there with us, Tom? Yeah, he, he's there. I know, but I mean, pre oh. actually present in the moment. Oh, okay. Probably, he's, he yeah. is muted right now, he, also. He might have gotten uh, pulled away for a moment. Well, <clears throat> then uh, until he's back, um, what, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I know one of the things that uh, I, I know about in, in, I know Andrew was talking about it, Sarah was talking about it some, but Taylor, um, I've been reading some of the stuff in Kalamazoo, and I know there was a recent skirmish with the police, but I know there's also other uh, multiple times in which the police have swept the the communities of, of unhoused people in in Kalamazoo. Could you talk about the situation uh, that's on the ground there? Yes. So um, uh, over the past you know two years that I've really been following and involved in um, the housing crisis, um, there have been numerous sweeps. Um, I, I don't think I could even tell you how many there have been because this was something that was occurring, you know, weekly, sometimes multiple times a week. Um, people being swept from, you know, behind storefronts or um, most recently it was the uh, the Urban Nature Center. Um, but uh, one of the biggest um, sweeps happened in the fall of 2021. Um, there was, um, a very large encampment um, that part of why it was so large was because there had been a prior sweep and they had told some of the, the unhoused folks to go to this area. Um, it was in a brownfield area, so it was a contaminated area. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people were staying there um, and there was a mass eviction, which was protested on uh, October 6th of 2021. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the area was cleared. Um, there were people right across from that area on October 8th. Um, some people that were left um, and didn't know where to go. Um, many people had their um, items bulldozed. 
you know, their tents ruined, things thrown away, uh, lost important items, um, like memorials or ashes of their loved ones. Um, people were given essentially five minutes to pack up everything they could before things were bulldozed. Um, and so on October 8th, um, when the remainder of unhoused, unhoused folks were in an area across from that original swept area, um, uh, police by the dozens um, were called to force people off of that area as well. Um, uh, and both protesters and unhoused folks were brutalized and um, arrested. And there are still people who are facing charges to this um, day um, for the events that took place. Um, and yeah, the like I said, the Urban Nature Center was uh, one of the most recent sweeps. Um, and I don't have a lot of details on that at the moment. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Tom back? Not yet. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Tom. Could you talk about I mean, just based a couple of things? One is, you know, Taylor's experience with uh, with with the uh, sweeps and stuff. I'm wondering whether you could share some of the experiences that uh, <clears throat> that Uptown Tent City has had. And also talk a little bit about the uh, the uh, Bring Chicago Home campaign. <laughs> okay, Bring Chicago Home campaign is about the real estate tax. It's about the buildings that are over a multi-million dollar deals they have down here. It's a one-time tax. That money is supposed to generate housing resources and jobs. If we get it on the ballot so that people can vote on it, you vote yes, everyone wins. It doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, no income at all, it don't matter if you vote for it. And, and it's a win, everybody gets it. If you vote no, nobody gets it. Everybody should get it, why not? And the other question was what? Well, just taking off of what Taylor was talking about, the experience that they've had in, in the sweeps in, in Kalamazoo and uh, other experience that other people have had, could you talk a little bit about the experience in Tent City with, the, with sweeps? Well, in the sweeps in the past that we had, they would take everything we had. they take our tent. They take all our personal property. They come down here and say, oh, you can't have a mattress and take it. Oh, you can't have this chair because you're homeless and they take it. We've had that in the past. What we're doing in the future is we're working with the city, Church and Sanitation, DCFS. You help us, we'll help you. Whatever they don't see down here, they can't, they can't get. If I got a mattress, it's, it's in a tent. You're not getting it because you can't touch it. You can't go into my house and take it. You ain't get that right. We got the same rights as anyone else's house. Our tent is our, is our home until we're housed. If someone's got a problem with it, come on. I got lawyers to back us, so come on. Our town is well equipped. I got more than one law firm backing us out here. And they're backing all the homeless on the street. So, yeah, you want to come after this camp? Come on. We got you. Mm. Thank you, Tom. Wow. You're welcome. It's, it's uh, really, yeah, it's infuriating and yet also exciting and inspiring to me your, um, you know, just perseverance over all these years in, um, and particularly now that the harassment um, is escalating again. Um, recently, there were uh, a couple of fires under the bridge that um, the alderman has been using to kind of step up some of the 
attacks and, um, you know, things like sweeps that happen every, you know, few seasons in Chicago in a very predictable cycle. And Tom has been on the front lines of that for a long time. And it's just, you know, it's it's something to think about. To Adam, you know. can, I, can I ask real quick, who, who, what word is that and which alderman? Because I really think we've got to call these motherfuckers out. You know, because we have some older persons that are more compassionate, but then this guy or woman or them, who who is it? Kappelman. James Kappelman, 46 Ward. Yeah, he's he's been one of the worst on this issue for a long time. To put it mildly. <laughs> he, he came very close to being um, voted out of office in the last election. And uh, there's another election coming up in about eight months. And I anticipate there'll be a considerable push to try to get him out again. Uh, <clears throat> well, to, to my understanding, I could be wrong, Tom, you, you could correct me. Uh, this is Patrick. Um, Kappelman is not running again, I heard. Mm, that's not what I heard. Oh, okay. I heard he is running. Okay, okay. I mean, oh. we had we have a candidate that went up against him before. I believe she's gonna win this time because she got a lot of people in uptown to back her up. And uptown's okay. voting for her and not him. And I'm gonna register every homeless person out here that wants to vote. Put her in office and put him out. Yeah. And I will join you. And I, um, just for some folks who may not know, some of the some of the, like the systematic attacks that uh, this alderman's trying to make, um, Tom, if you want to talk about like his, well, he wants trying... to put up citations for anyone, anyone that buys propane gas for the people out here. We need that propane gas to stay warm in the winter time. We cook with it out here. Everything. You want to set up a citation. Anyone that buys this gas, you're going to give them a ticket. So if the union pays for all of our gas out here, you're going to give me a ticket. I'm waiting. Let them do it. The other thing Kevin's out to do is we have a hospital out here. He showed the parking lot that was by the emergency room. They want to put in luxury housing. Everyone in uptown's fighting against it. It's not going to happen. They ain't putting it up. As soon as they break ground, I'm putting camp there. <laughs> I'm not going to play. Anything else? <laughs> I wonder whether anybody, uh, we've had a little bit of, of uh, conversation. But I'm wondering whether anybody, any of the panelists, want to uh, comment to en uh, to anybody else you know, on their, um, you know, on their experiences or ask questions or whatever, or give uh, further updates from your local right. work. And yeah. I'd like to hear more from Bonnie actually because she really just introduced herself. I'm I'm interested in in her experiences as well. Oh. What kind of experiences have you had? My experiences as a disabled person, as a homeless person, I believe this country, the aldermans, the mayor, the mayor especially, but the aldermans and the other folks, the governors, they don't care. They show us that they don't care. They send us around the world, they say, like for me, in order for me to get my disability, I had to go from to the social security board. Mm -hmm. Then I had to go all the way to the aid <laughs> office and then I had to go to another office. I'm like, I'm homeless one. I'm not mobile. I don't have a car. Why do I have to go to di three different places in order to get approved to show that I'm disabled? And you see that I really am disabled when I walked in the social security board whom I'm seeking help from, and you constantly giving me the runaround. One, 
You come to give me the run around, not just that. You don't care. You have me calling and calling and calling. And then you constantly talk to me like I don't have no understanding. And like I told the lady on the phone and the lady that I met in person at the Social Security office, everything that the government, the U.S. government have done, they took my house. They took my job. Actually, they didn't take my job. I was hit by a car. So that made me not be able to work with that. They took my money. They took all everything that could help me survive out here as a human. Or as they call us in the Constitution, we the people, the first three words they told us, they didn't tell us that they're talking about the people that are wealthy. And that made me really want to fight for my people, all of us. It don't matter not what nationality you are. I don't deal with race because race is a hateful thing. And that's what the U.S. government taught us, hate. And then when we start hating them, they want it's a problem. Oh no, these are the children you gave birth to. So now take what you're giving out. And I'm willing to fight and show them that we are the people of the United States and we're gonna take our country back. Thank you. Amen. Is that Patrick wanting to say something? Um I, I think, uh, Lou, uh, I, I'd just like to say a little bit more if we're at kind of a, a, a brief pause here about kind of our, um, you know, hopes for this conversation. Um, right. That, that was, I, I mean, I think uh, Bonnie just expressed like a revolutionary vision for, uh, you know, how we can solve this crisis. And um, I think that's, you know, the reason we gathered today, um, you know, this is uh, put on by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, and uh, the title is Housing for All. And so we want to talk about what it will take to win Housing for All, um, you know, and as we hear these updates from people's local work and personal testimonies and personal experiences like Bonnie just shared, um, you know, we want to talk on a level of strategy for revolutionary change you know and and about how we can work more effectively uh, together across um our struggles within our local areas and across localities you know and um and talk about where we see new creative approaches and new tactics um and uh yeah you know we imagined this as being a, a kind of creative dialogue so um you know, personal stories like Bonnie just shared are, are great. Um, and we're going to hear more p poems later. But, you know, if people want to share poems, lyrics, stories, songs, dreams, prayers, visions, whatever, you know, um, we, we want to really encourage everyone to share, um, you know, as, as freely as possible. Oh, and I, I didn't introduce myself. I'm, I'm Adam, uh, here they pronouns. And um, yeah, I've done some work with the Chicago Union of the Homeless helping that group to get started over the last few years. Um, but I think, you know, I'm here in this role just mostly as a revolutionary and uh, as a revolutionary artist and wanting to think again about how do we uh, approach this crisis um, creatively and um, with the goal of winning housing for all. And yeah, Lou, did you want to add anything to that? And did you want to introduce yourself too? Uh, well, I'm Lou Rosenbaum and, uh, <clears throat> and a member of the league and uh, active in trying to get as many of these dialogues going as possible. That's really all I want to say about myself. I've been around for a year or two, so uh, some of you know me. Um, but um, I'm, I'm more interested in hearing what other folks have to say. And I know Andrew just barely touched the surface when he was introducing himself and wondering whether he wants to add any more at this point. That would be helpful, I think, to just join in with the conversation. Um, so uh, for, for us, um, approximately about a month ago, um, 
the city of North Las Vegas just bulldozed our small, tiny home community. And we had about four residents. We spent about five months of community effort building this. And this was land that we owned. It was private property. Uh, they actively found out where we were and um, kept sending code enforcement to us, kept sending police, um, tried to get on our private property without a warrant. Um, and it's not a very big property, but we had a small, we built a small fence around it uh, for privacy of our residents. And um, they just hit us with code violation after code violation. Um, and we had fixed most of these violations. They were just the smallest, pettiest things about like um, poles being too high or just anything they can come up with. Uh, and we were um, at a court date in May to appeal this, but the um, North Las Vegas police came with a warrant anyways and uh, order to bulldoze everything we've done and displaced uh, mm. um, these four people. And this has just been a common issue with us, uh, them just, you know, they know who most of us are. Um, they, they target us. We, I mean, it's gotten to the point where whenever we do any kind of action, we have to like have babysitters to walk us to our car or follow us home, or we have to uh, check in with each other because Often someone will get pulled over, anything that can be found, any, any little issue that thing can jam us up is, a, is just a, um, a constant issue. So, and I'll just say, we, we keep trying to find creative ways with these huts. We, um, prior to buying property, we were putting them on trailers and um, strategically placing them uh, and registering the trailers with the DMV and strategically placing them around the city. But again, we, we have, it almost feels like teams of police that go and look for this. And um, somehow they're always found and cited. Uh, we're given a couple of days to move them, but sometimes uh, they won't even follow their own rules and they'll just tow the huts. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's essentially what we're doing. The, the, our, our volunteer that owns that property has got over $10,000 in fines. Um, we're, we're trying to get um, council people and local politicians involved and the media involved and trying to get uh, um, help from, from different legal groups. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that, that's where we're at. Wow. I don't know what to say. Yeah, that's an intense a, a state lot of, of struggle. Are reacting in the chat? I mean, how can they fucking do that? I'm sorry, private property. Even it just goes to show how dehumanizing they are. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of. I'm sorry, just pissing me off. A lot of angry people that not angry, but um, right, righteous anger. Right? I I don't understand how they can get away with that. And Tom, may I say that I love that bravado of like, all right, you won't let me have propane. I've got my attorneys behind me. But um, I've been thinking a lot about what it's going to take to get not just this demand, but the stop on CPS budget cuts, COVID justice for um, especially black and brown people. And um, I, it's, it's more than conversations like this. Obviously, it's how are we going to unite physically? Like, I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of going to City Hall. I'm tired of appealing to these fucking all the persons that don't give a damn. We're going to have to think you know, what, what's next, right? Because we can only give so many speeches. I mean, that, that's where I'm at. I think I'm just fed up because I'm tired of going to city hall and, you know, um, trying to change the law and then having the laws be stuck in the rules committee because Lori Lightfoot doesn't want to do the humanizing thing, you know, like a lot of politicians in your area. So I don't know, that's kind of where I'm at. But, um, mm -hmm. and I wasn't very positive, but like, how do we come together, you know, and, and, and fucking fight? So like, if they're attacking you, oh shit, all of us masks show up. You know, or, or I don't know, just what, whatever it takes. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. I see uh, Yolanda for stack. I just want to say that, yeah, I think um, the point is well taken, Hesu. And, um, you know, as security minded as the next person, I would love to hear about, um, you know, uh, more direct tactics that are happening around the country right now that are challenging. Um, the actual power structures and property uh, structures. I, I think the fact that 
Andrew, you and your comrades and, and your people that you work with are being so blatantly targeted shows a, a certain strategic weakness on the part of the um, state and the, you know, um, the interests and powers that are working against you. You know, if they have to be so obvious about going after uh, people in such um, egregious ways, um, it, it shows, you know, that um, in a sense they're, they're on the defensive. And, and so I think Tom's point is well taken too about like, let them come for us. That's that will give us the opportunity to expose um, and and unite more people around these basic needs. Um, but that only happens if we actually unite, if we actually, um, you know, are able to tell the story and overcome these, uh, you know, obstacles, um, to your point, Hesu. But, um, okay, Yolanda and then Bonnie. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, I want to share a couple of things. Last weekend, I found out that Luis Rodriguez, the California Green Party candidate for governor, was going to be um, talking in Oakland. When I got, I found that it was being sponsored by Poor Magazine, although they can't support anybody for candidates. But what I found out is that I asked the lady that's in charge, Tanya, I said, well, how's it going? You guys moved here because they, they bought a house and they have several people living there. And she said, not really. She said that the city is not wanting to negotiate with them, that I don't even know if they're legal or not. They, I didn't want to ask, but the, the conversation lasted quite a while. But she said, I, I thought that, you know, they had a house, there, a, a big collective, and she said the city that they could provide housing, but they don't want to listen to Poor Magazine. Uh, another lady that's part of the Poor Magazine uh, collective said that 70% of the homeless people in Oakland are African Americans. They said a lot of this stuff, which I'm not going to get into. Also, here in San Francisco, I was invited. I got an email from Coalition on Homeless. There's a supervisor, Mandel or something. He wants to uh, to to build shelters for the homeless, so so that they have somewhere to go. And so the Coalition of the Homeless and I went to the Board of Supervisors for meeting. And that next meeting is coming first at ten o'clock. And I, and we said, well, you know that the thing about when this when the city of San Francisco says they're going to provide shelter, that it means sweeps, and we don't want that. And then uh, some of us, a lot of us, one of the supervisors, I can't think of her name now. She's Latina. She said they wanted to put an amendment where they, as long that it, it might be a that it, they will support it if it included permanent housing. Um, along with it. it. It got left up in the air because um, that the guy mandated, they got to discuss it some more next year, so it's going to be a continuation. And we also said also you, you can't force somebody into housing if they don't want it. Most people do, homeless people do want housing, but you you know, you, you can't force them into shelter. This will be for shelter because they would tell the people that they have a place for them to live. And then some of us said that the, the, the what, Martin versus Boys, where the Supreme Court said that um, if you're homeless and, and you don't have a place to go, the local municipalities cannot throw you out of your little space on the sidewalk because you have no place to go. So we were citing that and then the man said no, because as long as the city, as long as you don't have a place to go, to go so they will be providing shelters. So, so there were a lot of speakers on Zoom and their own person who said that shelters are not safe, they don't want to go to shelters. So it's not an open and shut case. It's, it's a question of democracy. It's a question of not, be, not taking away the homeless rights to decide what they want to do, especially with Governor Newsom's proposed legislation where they were forcibly um, 
give some kind of bank beds to people that are homeless and, and mentally ill, but they were forced into take medication with a coincidental article, article a couple of years ago, said the medication, not just for the homeless, for everybody to reduce the life. And I and I am very much of the opinion that once you take a person's right, like the power opportunity to take to make a sort of harm decision, unless of course they cannot and they can't even read or write, then you, when you don't let a person decide what they want to do, especially the homeless, you're reducing that person's life. So it's a question of democracy, it's a question of life, it's a question of housing, and it's a question of there's so many contradictions. And and um, and, and I and I like what Alan said, yeah, if, if we take a month and a half, the, and, and they come after us, we'll denounce them. Uh, it sounds, that, that sounds hard, hard to me, that sounds positive, thank you. Mm. Wow, thank you, Yolanda. Turn it over to Bonnie now. Yes, please, Bonnie. To answer the question of how we can make them, give them back their words. We come together, take all their power back from them. They holler, they working for us anyway. They say, we working for the people. What people you working for? You leave everyone out. Those that are working the nine to five and especially the homeless. You are not working for nobody but yourself. You thinking about yourself. So we need to come together, take all our issues with all the anger that we have and give it back to them. Give them back their word, their contradictions and everything. We give them that, they ain't got no other choice but to stand up or put get the hell out the way. We are the people. That's how we fight this. We tired of being told one thing and then they're doing another. Oh, if you vote for me, or oh, I'm gonna make this happen for your city. Or if you vote for me, I'm gonna make this happen for your life. All the lies they have told, we're tired of that. They fighting us on every level. They're not just using race as an excuse. They're using our ability of work skills. Some people don't know how to work. They got teachers out here, teach us. Help us, help one for another. I can't leave my fellow man behind, even though yes, I'm no longer homeless, but I still fight for my homeless community because they are the people of the United States too. We made the perfect union. We are the people, all of us. If we take our power back from them, instead of keep allowing them to give us excuses and excuses after excuses, make them stand on their word. You're nothing but your word. I don't care how much money you have. I can tell you right now today, I got $5. We only two people. If you need 250, I'm gonna give you 250. I'm not gonna say, oh girl, you know, I ain't got that 250 today. No. We're constantly letting them do that to us. They're selling us lies. They ain't selling us dreams. Our dreams is what do come true. We know right. our dreams do come true. If we put the effort into it, we get up and go to work every day fighting for our lives. But they constantly telling us one thing and they're doing the other. So either we're going to keep letting them sweeping us up under the rug and walking over us like we're not nothing. We have to show them that we are the people. We make this country, not them. No matter what office you hold, we need to make them understand who are the people we are. We go to work just like you go to work. Okay, you sitting in a higher office than I am, so what? Do you really know what you really sitting in the office for? No, because you told a lie. You said, I'm gonna help you do this. And when I come in for that help, you send me over here, when I don't have a way to get over there to get the help that I need that you said that you were going to give me. Give them back their word. Stop letting us get swept up under the rug. Take all our anger out on them. Let us drive them crazy. They done drove us crazy for years. We done sat down and set aside for too long. Show them who they're messing with. They want to fight and bomb and every, do, do everything else to everybody else. Now let America take back its power and show them how great we really are as the people. You know, that's a great way to segue into our next section, but, but Andrew has his hand up. And maybe, uh, Andrew, if you could comment what, what you wanted to comment and then lead off the poetry section. Um, real quick, I just wanted to say some of the um, tactics we do, uh, uh, and I'll post our group info in the chat. Um, we, uh, 
uh, one thing we do is we use Instagram to post a lot of what's going on and what's happening. And uh, it's generated a lot of fundraising for us for a lot of people who can't get involved on the street level. Um, they do have uh, money they can contribute. And uh, prior to our property being um, demolition, demolished, uh, during the height of pandemic, we had about 26 huts built. And this was on public land. And uh, the city had bulldozed all of those as well, displacing all of those people. And it generated in a lot of money. And that's where we got the idea of buying land from that point, of course, that didn't turn out as we thought. But posting this information on social media lets people know what's going on. One, we also put the faces of these council people and the people that are coming after us. We put uh, videos up of interactions with police and it's, it's changed the culture in the way that they have to deal with us in a very different way because it's all on there now. Um, we also, uh, not just for the homeless issues, but shootings and other matters here in the city, um, we've, we've protested outside of, of many of these people's houses. And of course they, they do not like that, um, but it's accountability. And again, we, we turn around and post this on social media and it, it's, it really is an effective way to bring a lot of people into what's going on um, because, you know, so many of us work and uh, may not have the time to be out there. And uh, it's since we rely, unfortunately, and fortunately on social media so much, it's an effective way for them to, um, to find out what's going on and participate in some way. Great. Um... So we're now entering the, the poetry segment and we're gonna have an exchange of poetry and maybe our round robin can start with uh, Andrew. You're muted, Andrew. Okay, sorry said to get set up. Um, this is called Desert Carp. Um, it's in reference to a fish we have in Las Vegas. Desert Carp. Other day, I heard a street shuffler advise, you teach a man to fish. He thought the idea of a community fridge keeps people lazy. I remember that PSA back in the waning days of Ronnie, the union buster Reagan. Teach them how to work. They'll feed themselves. This cozy narrative would convert the eye of philanthropy into the church of tumbling slot machine reel. Billions of dollars pumped into programs. Not-for-profit heads grew fat and built futures for themselves, knowing if the cause made good, the money will quit coming. I recall a woman in line at a food share arguing that she deserved it more than the guy before her because she busted her ass collecting cans and he didn't. That's easy to say when you don't factor in the person, the trauma, addiction, the disability, physical, mental, who knows truly another's burden. When you get the victims of a system accepting it in a brown paper bag an entrepreneur gets its wings, but even they go nowhere for labor fused feathers cannot reach skyscrapers. Where are we now? You got the poor man quoting what the rich man picked up while doing business over in Asia, reading Taoism for capitalists. <laughs> but the poor man badly quoting Lao Tzu thinks it's a passage from the Bible. Yeah, nobody actually reads that either, but plenty go around speaking it. It took our school system years to figure out hungry kids don't test well, yet we cannot understand why adults have a hard time of comprehension or how they keep a grasp on any sanity while existing on an empty belly exposed to all kinds of weather. We surely cannot understand why people have completely given up all the absurdity of a society that projects its failures on the most disenfranchised. We specialize people like we specialize animals. One is precious, the other is slotted for death. I don't eat fish. There's no ponds in this desert. I hook a carp, I hook myself. It's not money, it's being 
with your community. Thank you. All right. Whoo. Wow. Oh man, I'm gonna go ahead and ask in advance if uh, the poets have a way of sharing these pieces with us afterwards, if you're comfortable with that. Um, that would be great, yes. yeah. I, I know I, I would love to revisit that piece, Andrew. What a powerful start. And um, yeah, thank you. Who would you like to call on next, Adam? Well, how I'd like to do this actually is rather than um, have me or you call on someone to like let it be more like a cipher, you know? And so whoever wants to speak next, um, you know, can go. We're, this, we're just happen, hap, this is just the part where we happen to be speaking in poetry or we're inviting you to speak in poetry, you know? Uh, but you can also give more context around your pieces. You know, we're still just ciphering. We're still just talking uh, politics and, and housing and, and revolution. We're just using poetry now, you know? So, Hesu, I saw you raise your hand. I, I know, I have a big mouth, but I haven't performed this piece. And uh, I wrote it for a, a comrade of mine. Well, I consider him a comrade, but he, he passed away. And then his wife passed away not too long ago. So um, it's, it's, there's a lot of cliches in here. It's a work in progress, but, you know, it, it, was, it was a good gift for him. Uh, it's called A House for Poems for, for Jay Menta. There is a space in my heart where your voice echoed beautiful flowing words of love rhymes to your wife, of prophetic imagery elevating us toward a better world. The dreams that nested there in that lonesome space crafted by your vision, our embryos in your soul, percolating hope, waiting to emerge, a transcendental phoenix in a triumphant alliteration of metaphors to fight poetry, of similes to crack hearts wide open, my own heart, and us ready to house your poems once more. So unfortunately, uh, I didn't get to hear any more of his poetry, but he, he was hands down one of the most talented poets I'd ever encountered. So it's super tragic that he died so young. And, um, but yeah, but that was for Jay. So now I will gladly share my poetry because you know, you know, I, I flow, I flow that way too. <laughs> like, <laughs> shamelessly sharing, there you go. Yes, thank uh, you. Maybe I'll reshare it in a different way. That looks like shit, all right. Thank you, thank you, comrades. We've got I other poems Eric. here. Yeah, there Hello. we go. somebody. Um, this poem is an older poem of mine, but it's about the how, how ever present the danger of becoming homeless is for you know, pretty much all of us if you're poor. Uh, it's called "Sleeping Here Tonight." The danger is always present. I too could possess hunger, belting out gurgles so loud as if Pavarotti found his way inside my stomach and it became an opera house filled with shattering cells and a crescendo of stomach acid attacking my will. I am made of dust and my bones dissipate under the sidewalk. I cannot sleep here tonight. I will not sleep here tonight, but I could sleep here tonight if everyone forgot my name and the sand in my eyes was my only reminder that I was still alive. If I crawled through viaducts at night with bloodshot being and wailing lungs, I could sleep here tonight. I could lie beside the road. We all could. Thank you. Mm. Wow. Eric, that all, everything just strikes me really, really powerful. Thank you. Well, Adam, why don't you? Sure, I can go. Um, and I'd love to hear from uh, more folks here too, um, if anyone else is holding out on us. Um, Bonnie and, then we can... and Sarah are holding out on us right now. Yes, so yes. We're definitely going <laughs> to require their <laughs> participation. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. Uh, 
and you'll you'll have uh, some time. I, uh, you can, if if there are any other poets out there, including Bonnie and Sarah, um, feel free to uh, use this time while I'm sharing to to find something of your own um, if you want to. But uh, you know, I want to share something on the on the vision tip. So this piece doesn't explicitly deal with housing per se, but it really deals more with just um, what would it look like if we all had not only housing, but health care, uh, food, water, clean environment, uh, freedom from uh, the, the state violence and police, um, and, uh, you know, all of our basic needs and all of our um, collective wealth as a society shared in common for all, you know, and, um, I, uh, I actually just shared this earlier this morning, uh, with, uh, my Torah study group with a, which a couple folks here might have actually, uh, been at, I think Robin was there, um, at least, and Daniel maybe too, um, but, uh, yeah, uh, just a, a, a little, um, serendipitous, uh, coincidence here, the, uh, in the Jewish calendar, the Torah portion for this week for this Shabbat today is um, the section that deals with the Jubilee year, which is perhaps the most economically radical um, uh, piece of law in the Hebrew Bible. It's in the book of Leviticus 25, I think. And um, there's this system of repeating um, Shabbats or Sabbaths not only for the people every seven days, but for the land every seven years. Um, and then after 50 years, which is seven times seven plus one, there's a jubilee year. That word is uh, transcribed from the Hebrew yovel, uh, which means ram or ram's horn. And it's, it's commanded that the, the, you will sound the horn loud, like a trumpet, and then at that point, all debts are essentially canceled and all property uh, claims are nulled. And it's a, a, a really powerful um, piece because uh, God actually says, uh, none of you own the land. Um, you're all residents here. Like there's no one can actually really own the land and be a landlord other than the creator, right? It's, it's an incredibly powerful piece. And so um, I was actually, it was in that spirit that I remembered I wrote this piece a couple years ago. Um, <laughs> and Lou, you kind of inspired this too because you uh, got me thinking a lot about that song, The Big Rock Candy Mountain by Harry McClintock. It's actually a, a traditional song in the hobo tradition of the 1920s, um, but Harry McClintock was the first to record it in 1928. And a couple years ago, I wrote an adaptation of it. And it just feels more natural to share it as a spoken word piece than as a song. I mean, I could sing it, but I, I think I'd rather just share it like this with you. Um, so here it is. Can you see it? Give me a thumbs up. Oh, and the last thing I'll say, the uh, actual Latin motto of uh, the city of Chicago, some of you know this, is herbs in ordo, a city in a garden. And so I was thinking about that, too, when I wrote this and imagining what this world to come, this new revolutionary change might look like in my own hometown. In the Big Rock Candy Mountain, the jails are made of tin, and you can walk right out again as soon as you are in. There ain't no short-handled shovels, no axes, saws, nor picks. Oh, I'm bound to stay where you sleep all day, where they hung the jerk that invented work in the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Harry McClintock, 1928. The People's Garden City. One evening as the sun went down and the man on TV was yapping, my friend shared a viral video of some kids singing and rapping, and the voice rang out so clear and loud with a radical new ditty and gave me a taste of a wondrous place called the People's Garden City. In the People's Garden City, the air is fresh and clean, with fruit trees up and down the streets, and everything is free. No grown-ups have to go to work. No kids have to go to school. You can chill or play or sleep all day. You can dance or sing or anything in the People's Garden City. In the People's Garden City, you can walk in any store and take whatever stuff you want and walk right out the door. 
There ain't no cash in the registers, no armed guards at the front. There's a million better things to do than hoard the stuff that belongs to you in the People's Garden City. In the People's Garden City, there ain't no need for cops, because the folks have everything they need, and the banks are filled with crops. There ain't no health insurance bills, no evictions or foreclosures. In the summer, it's safe to swim the rivers and lakes. If the winter's cold, you can print a coat in the People's Garden City. In the People's Garden City, every plant and culture grows, and the first folks of the land will teach you what you need to know. There ain't no walls or borders, just trees and great big sky. Oh, I hope and pray that we'll see the day when you and me can blossom free in the People's Garden City. We can build it here this very year, the People's Garden City. I love that. Wow. Yay! Nice. Yeah, I'm gonna need that. Adam. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> Word, thanks, comrades. I love that. <sighs> And I guess, yeah, I, if I could say just one more thing, I know I've talked a lot, um, but, you know, I'm really on this tip right now about, like, fuck work. Like, I'm so over it. Like, they, we don't have to work. Like, <laughs> like, like Bonnie said, some people uh, can't or they don't know how to work. You know, like, um, like, we are human beings and we just deserve to uh, live. And not just live, but live a good life just for being alive, just for being human beings, you know? And so, um, it, it, especially now, since the, the who workers have to compete with more and more is machines. Machines, robots, computers, they don't have families to feed. They don't need to take breaks. Uh, they don't form unions, you know? So it's a lot cheaper. You can, you can work a machine like a slave. And so that's why it's uh, more and more um, reverting to more uh, backwards labor conditions, and we have to fight for just the right to live, you know. Um, so once we grasp that, once we really, you know, understand what it means to be human and that you get to live even if you can't work, even if you don't want to work, you still deserve to live. That's when, you know, I think um, we're going to see the, the unity and the, uh, the fight that we need. All right, I'm done. I Thank agree 100% with you. Amen. I'm Who back. was that? I can, uh, this is fine. I can talk now. Yes, please. With the Union of Slums. Hello, everyone. My name is Zifine with the Union of End Slums. We are a West Side organization from the North Lawndale area. We are, we, are, um, we are really trying to build our foundation, trying to get, get up and running, like, on a, on a higher level as far as getting our 501 c 3 and things of that nature. But right now, we're just really trying to link with all the organizations around the city so we could put together something big, you know, like show our real force we could have with the numbers of the people and just getting on the accord, you know? Hello. Oh, and I also oh, have yeah. a, and I also got a little piece, too. Yes, oh, good. I Go for it. Check it. Check this out. Um, school of hard knocks. I learned many lessons. It ain't about the message. Did you get the message? Sometimes you got to read between the lines to get the directions. Or sometimes the answer is within the question. Why do we idolize material possessions? Why do we live up to other standards of what's perfection? Why in order to feel safe, we carry a weapon? It's like the more we stay on our phones, we lose a connection. That's why, as of counting the paper, I'm counting the blessings. Here and now is a gift. We call it the present. We have an impression we have freedom of an expression. But freedom is just an expression. We all lost, but we starting to find the direction. On our way up, that's the only progression. You, can lie, you can't lie to God, but you can lie to the reverend. But if it's not a truth, then it's not a confession. That's, that's a little bit. Ooh. So I got more. Bars. <laughs> <Ours. Ooh. laughs> <Man>. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Sound. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm just I'm just hoping we all can link together and really, like, I'm, I'm with you with the not working thing because, um, I mean, we all got to work 
in order to make the world revolve the way it does. You know, we all got to play our part. Yes. But, but I think um, I think if we could just like a little bit of a lot goes a long way. So I'm thinking like if we could all try to help each other with whatever we feel like our purpose is, is here on earth to do like we all probably got business or even a hobby that could turn into a business. Like, what do you enjoy doing? You know, what do you, what do you feel like your contribution is to the world? Is I, I want I want to know that from every last one of y'all, you know? And I just feel like that's the way we can end the slums. Like that's the only way we'll be able to do it. We start to understand each other on a different level, you know, like talk to each other, talk to each other, talk about the things that we don't talk to a lot of people about. Well, we got to come into groups like this because we can't talk to the average person because they, what you say, this and that, we got to change all that type of mentality, you know? So but only thing people understand is money. Money is the root of a lot of things. And the only way people could really try to get that type of, get you their ear if they feel like you can help them get some money. So that's why I want, I hope we can all support each other in this business. So we can use the money from our business in order to fund the things that we really want to do and be able to live uh, our, our, live our life and be fulfilled in what we're doing. Amen. Absolutely. Thank you. Is it Ifeni? Ifeni Chuku. It means all things are possible with God. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Ifani. Yeah, no, I, I really want to just agree with that. And I think you helped clarify what I meant even more than I did the first time I said it. Um, that, yeah, I think our very existence as humans is to work, to take care of our own bodies, to take care of our loved ones, to raise kids, to take care of the elderly, to take care of pets, to, you know, clean up your community or, you know, grow a garden, you know, and share whatever extra food you have or make music or poetry or drawings or whatever it is, everyone is going to work if they're just allowed to be human because that's what being human is all about. But that's a different kind of work than working for some capitalist who gives you enough money to survive. You know, that's not even living, you know. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I um, absolutely agree with that, you know. Yes. Like you, can't, you can't put no price on nobody's life, you know, and what their value of time is. That should be that should be up to the person what they put value they put on their time. You can't tell the person you only worth five dollars an hour. That means if I had fifteen dollars right now in my pocket, but thirty dollars, I can own any last one of y'all for two dollars for two hours. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's it's a crazy system that we got right now. But we gotta do something ourselves to change, you know. But it's gonna take sacrifices. I, I want to just jump in there for a minute because I think the two of you have really identified a, a very important uh, fact, and that is that there's a difference between a work and jobs. A job is something you get paid for in order to make somebody else rich. But when you work, you contribute to the benefit of the community. And, I, and I think this. Absolutely. I think this is the uh, this is the necessary direction that society is taking, whether or not capitalism wants it or not. Uh, and you see, in, you see, uh, you know, the efforts to do that in the in the uh, encampments that certainly in the encampments that Tom you know has been part of, where people take care of each other. You know, in, in the even if they're living under a viaduct, they take care of each other. They have to in order to survive and in order to help the community. So I think you know those are the that, that's what we're that's the significance of what we're dealing with here. I think. Um, hey, can I add to that because it's Absolutely. a thing of what you guys are talking about, guys, gals, and others. There's a growing movement in China and other countries where people, young people especially, just don't work anymore. They, they, you know, they spend time with their loved ones. They maybe don't even have a house or they'll work maybe one day a week. But I think it's in great part because what the, what the hell does work have to offer them? You know what I'm saying? They can't buy homes. They can't, you know what I mean? And so um, I, I think this is what capitalism is doing, right? And even when you see youth like play fucking video games all the time, I think that's still a part of capitalism. Not just that they have the games, but, you know, <clears throat> 
I, I just think there needs to be more vision and hope for young people and not this competitive bullshit about, you know, where are you gonna go to college? You know, where are you gonna get a job? If you have to, if you, you're competing against the fucking robots, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I, I agree with that. And, and uh, I've seen a lot more TikTok videos too on people who are like, why are we working? Like work sucks, you know? Um, and, and it's, it's from all, all sectors, not just youth. Like people are just tired and fed up, you know? Anyway, so I'll shut up, sorry, thanks. I do want to, there, there are two people on stack, but I do want to wind up the poetry uh, segment if we can. I'd like to ask Bonnie to offer something uh, as, a, as a way of closing this, if that's possible. Uh, Bonnie, I know you're a, a really wonderful poet and I'd love to hear you. I'm gonna take a little bit. Um, um, I would like for my Felipe to take over for, for the poetry wise, because he's a little bit better at it than I am, if you don't mind. Whatever you would like. Yes, please. Um, Felipe, thank you. And you can introduce yourself too, if you want. Yes, I'm. So yeah, I've been here the whole time listening to Green, disagreeing, and all of that. How's everybody doing? I am, well, I am Sergeant at Arms of the Chicago Union of the Homeless. Um, I lived in Tent City for close to four years on Roosevelt and Displays. Went through the best times and absolute worst. I don't see anybody having a worse time as far as being in an encampment or being out on the street and not having anything that is kind of as low as you can probably get as far as my own experience however thanks to the people that 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 came out and and adam patrick and 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 susan and all the people that came out to help us to put their hand out and let people know that there are people out there who actually want to help and 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 get people what they're actually needing some people don't want to leave being homeless some people are striving to get homes like i was ronnie was um so we're in our place and we're living lovely and as far as as far as everything else goes all i all i'm concerned is to try to help school people regardless of the situation that you're going through i've been there i'm pretty sure i've been there there's a few things i could think of that i haven't done however um sometimes people need help even if they're even if they don't want housing sometimes people look they have housing they just rather be outside or whatever the case may be we they need help too so I'm here for that. Well, I'm also to help people get housing. I'm not someone who can get you housing, but I can point you in the right direction in order to get to where I'm at right now. Anyway, so this poem was written by David Darbyshire, and it's called Homeless. As a homeless boy with no past or future, trying to live life with joy his body he'd nurture. As time slowly snailed by, he believed in his inner strength. He knew he wouldn't die. He proved that he proved this at great length. All, all he needs is a good plan. Stay strong, be a man. He will get his home one day. I believe him. In him, I will pray. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you. Amen. Thank you. All right, you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and before we, uh, sorry, um, Lou, I was just going to say before we um, move on with the folks uh, who have been very patient on stack, I, I do just want to say that even if the like formal poetry section has ended, that that actually doesn't mean the poetry has to end. And I, I would love to just invite uh, people to comment and again to comment in whatever way they want to. And if a poem or a quote or a song or a prayer or a dream or story or whatever feels appropriate to share, um, to feel free to do so. And thank you to all the folks who have shared poems uh, so far. 
Uh, Debbie Hines is uh, uh, was on stack. Is yeah, she... we have Deborah and Ran on stack. Now there she is, Debbie. You you were on stack first before Ran, so go ahead. Okay, how's my audio? Am I able to be heard? Okay. You are. It just able got to a little heard. better. Yeah, it was a little quiet at first. So just be close to the mic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just do a quick look at my. If you bear with me. Yeah, my settings, just one moment while I check to make sure I'm at. All right, so how, this is okay. Yes, right. sounds good. Uh, I want to address, uh, uh, thank you everyone for your presentation and um, also um, for organizing this and inviting me. I want to address this issue of work that really strikes a nerve with me, especially the aspect of it, work under a capitalist society specifically especially the aspect of it where uh, it seems to be accepted that they can define a person by their job title. And I'm retired now, but I worked ardently and hard for many years in under this system. Uh, and I found this very strong drive to, oh, you do this? Well, then this is what you'll do or you do this, we don't have that now, we can't hire. Well, I did that, I mastered it, I can do something else, you know, was my attitude. But this attitude was made me a, a square peg in a world of round holes, so to speak. So that's very important. Also, one other point I wanna make is, uh, I, I was looking desperately for a job to make a job change during the recession about 10 years ago. And I caught on very quickly that the situation had worsened just deplorably. Employers wanted me to work with no benefits so that I could become enslaved and piece together two and three jobs just to earn a living and have no medical coverage and talk about dehumanization it was like my my being as a person with talents and individuality did not exist. And not to mention what I had to offer, unless I could put a title, attorney, accountant, a blah, blah, a this. A, a, and some of the titles that I, I did work at, proofreader, esthetician, were alien because they weren't mainstream. So there was that issue too. So uh, thanks for listening to me. Those are my observations. And um, I, I'm, I'm relieved to be in a population of people here who understand this dehumanization uh, and devaluing of people based on labels. Thanks. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Ram. Yeah, well, we mentioned work. Um, Hell with being a wage slave that where we make ourselves available to be exploited, unpaid labor, expressed as profit to somebody else, the business. I just point to the fact that with over 1 million people dying from COVID in this country, the vast majority of them were not considered of value. And they lamented a few that were recognized as being famous, but the vast majority this being a culling event, eliminated a body of people that were aged and affirmed and not available to be made a profit from. And hence, there was very little concern about them passing. Just don't plug up our hospital system so that those that are work, go to work. In other words, those that avail themselves of being exploited can get medical care. I mean, who is to judge the value of myself somebody that's been retired for a long time, or in another that since I don't have a job, I do not work and supply profit to another. I'm just a burden on the rest of society. So my death by COVID or any other means doesn't really matter to the system that we live in. That's an important point. Um, I Eduardo. Think we, yeah, Eduardo, go ahead. I, I like the discussion, it's really interesting, uh, but the housing is a big problem. I'm a Vietnam veteran and 
I'm in contact with this lady. I invited her to the thing. She's about a uh, housing advocate. Her name is Des Martinez. She's a plaintiff in a lawsuit against the state, in particular city of Fresno, when it passed the city, or city ordinance, which is unconstitutional, saying that observers can't watch somebody when they're being, the things are being towed away. And that's, uh, and another thing about her, Duran, when Andrew was talking about, they've been harassing her because she's been an advocate for years, harassing her. They cut down her encampment. And then, uh, well, and then when she's trying to get benefits or housing, they really make it hard for her. So the last question is, would, is anybody familiar with a program called housing trust funds? And if so, uh, what do you think about it, whether it's good or bad? And lastly, I invited her to this, uh, the Zoom, but I guess she wasn't able to make it. Are you going to record? Are you going to send it out so maybe I could send it to her? The recording will be posted on the Learner website within the next few days. Okay, thank you. That's it. I'll, I'll, and I'll, on, uh -huh. on the question of the housing trust fund, yeah. uh, anybody have an answer to that question that they would like to, to jump in on? Can you repeat the question again, Eduardo? Um, um, you have, are they familiar with the housing trust fund funds or funds? It's supposed to be a public funds used to for low income or affordable housing, but it really isn't implemented, not even in Fresno, where I live. They may not be familiar with it because I don't know if it's just a, a program they have in California or I'm not sure. That is a good technical question. I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember the legal mechanism that was used recently in Philly and other places, um, and the, the legal term is escaping me yeah. right now. Are you thinking um, of land trust? Yeah, yes, land trust. Exactly land trust. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Similar that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. And um, other people here uh, know more about this and can speak better to it than I am. But in the case of the land trust, I, the, I, there have been some significant um, uh, victories uh, or um, I think advances in the fight for the right to people to um, uh, continue to occupy land and um, even fight for housing using uh, land trusts, I believe in Philadelphia, among other places. Thank you. If anyone else knows more about that, um, I, I'm. Uh, I think Patrick might know more than I do about that. Um, but there's also some folks here that I haven't uh, heard from yet. Um, and I'd love to just in encourage everyone to jump in um, with, you know, more points of information or testimonies or questions or responses or poems. <laughs> well, we haven't heard from Sarah yet on, on uh, poetry. And I'd love to hear her uh, her take on some of this stuff, her poetic take. Yes, okay. please. Oh, okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll read you this book out of, so you can't see it, out of this book that was published a couple of years ago called Cement, by um, Swimming with Elephants Press. This is called Manifestos. My young friend slept under wadded newspaper and there lies underground in the BART station or near a dark dune by the heaving ocean's eye. In the rains or dry, I wept over his dreaming leg, limbs. Someone reaches into his pocket. Some, someone holds the cup. Gratitude balances the black well of compassion. This overwhelming dialectic, what is new and arising, shooting flames through the broken places. The Senate voted to cut food stamps. Why? Written on a cardboard sign. The rich pay no tax. I did pay. Now I beg. Anything helps. Love enough for my spanging cup overflowing or empty. Spanging equals spare changing, the kids call it. Help make this skinny kid a fat one. I know the politic of its young cheek that rises over the horizon with the roses of cracking dawn in February, when hiding from the cold and holding on to fugitive bedding and chatting, organizing late online 
is the order of the raw evening. When will we be warm again? Iraq vet need food for my wife, my dog, and me. Light of day stretched on the sidewalk was rousted up early and got on his business of revolution early, wakened by the crack apart of its dawning. For some reason, the cops didn't bother us in the park last night. We need to fall off a tower of Z's into some real sleep. We need ID to get a room at the Henry Hotel. They picked up their gear, she with her guitar, he with his little drum, shouldered it and went off to seek some stolen sleep again, my young friends. 50 bucks a night for all the bed bugs that can bite you is the deal here in St. Francis City. Sleep in the shadow of an endless rent cop passed out down in the station, dreaming of sleep. Pages folded and scattered to the wind, unflagging manifestos of the homeless young. Gonna need another revolution just to get a little sleep. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Wow. Well, uh, that poem gets me Thank every you time. all for your wonderful poetry. Uh, Sarah, if you could put a, a, a way for us in, in the chat to, to uh, for people to find out about how they can get that book. Um, I think you just have to go online and, and look up. I'll put the, the, the elephant's press. Um, I... I'm not sure where it's actually probably somewhere off of like Amazon. I'm not sure if you yeah, could get it. Right on the chat and I'll look for it real quick. Okay. All right. Um, okay. And it's called Cement. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, Oops. that last line. Well. Um, Always okay, I put it on a direct message for some for some reason. Let me do that again. Okay, right. please continue. <laughs> You're good. Um, I I would like to check in with Patrick to see if you'd like to speak just a little bit to the um story. Thank you for finding that example. That's exactly what I was thinking of from Philadelphia. Um, about the um the struggle uh, over space and housing that um, ended up using this uh, um, mechanism of the community land trust and also how that speaks to any of the larger ideas we've been talking about um, or anything else you want to add. Yeah, yeah. I um, Yeah, so I remember hearing about this back in 2020. Um, I don't really am enough I'm affiliated with anyone in Philadelphia Housing Action. Um, although I remember having a meeting with, with some of them anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm not too caught up on all that they're doing, but yeah, just remember that they had this big uh, campaign to take over 50 homes uh, unoccupied, uh, I believe um, city homes. Uh, I believe, yeah, owned by PHA um, or Philadelphia Housing Authority, not Philadelphia Housing Action, um, and simultaneously create, um, I think, a nonprofit that would own a community land trust um, that the uh, homes were then placed into ownership of. And a trust is a uh, a, uh, a, a permanent, you know, um, legal category for um, keeping something a certain way, keeping a piece of property a certain way. So I don't know, I feel, yeah, that, that it's a, can be a very successful strategy. Um, it's kind of like, you know, um, what we're trying to do is the same thing, except everywhere, right? We're trying to, we're trying to create community land trust on the whole planet. Um, but these small, 
um, victories, I think, are are really useful. Um, you know, just stories to follow and and understand how the um, the struggle for creating an alternative type of property structure and and community ownership uh, works. Um, and it's just super inspiring. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think that's really important. I think the, uh, there's a really significant um, interplay here on the question of land trust and what we heard from Andrew earlier in terms of actually buying a piece of property. Uh, one of the things that we have to be aware of is that there are all kinds of efforts that are going on um, uh, to attempt to uh, for self-government in a certain sense, but we're never going to get the self-government that we need until we're able to deal with this in, as, a, as a whole. And we see this, I mean, Andrew's example of how this, the city just went ahead and uh, even though they had private property, even though it was their own land, the city just decided that was it, you know, screw them, we're going to take over. Uh, and land trusts have also had similar kinds of experiences where you know the government basically says hey it's not in our interest to let you to uh, allow to to exist so we are now going to unexist you and the the issue of our coming together here as this group of people attempting to figure out how we how do we strategize what does it mean to have real people's power in a situation that we have to that we're facing, I think Adam raised this earlier, uh, and and I think this is really the question that we're all addressing in some way, tangentially. We're all coming at it from different perspectives, but we're all trying to figure out how do we actually and and Tom, you know, in confronting, you know, the uh, the, the building of this uh, these uh, uh, luxury apartments. Uh, and what what are we going to do? How, we're going to stop those those suckers from doing that. And if they do, we're going to set up a camp encampment right in front of them. You know, all of this is part of what what is challenging the power of capital that no longer has the power that it once had. It seems like it has, but the very fact that it's throwing more and more of us out of our homes and creating a group of people like us, like the people here, who are, who are not just destitute, but really the, the way of organizing for the future. Uh, so I just wanted to just throw that in because I think that, we're, that there is no perfect solution that we're going to find, but there is this struggle that is going to get us step-by-step toward where we need to go. Um, it's All a right. Thank you, Lou. Um, I am aware that we're uh, less than 20 minutes to the hour here. I want to uh, check in with Taylor, one of our panelists, who we haven't heard from in a while, just to see if there's anything right. uh, that you want to respond to from the conversation. This had quite a wide-ranging conversation. Um, and then I'd also love to hear from uh, some of the folks who haven't spoken yet, um, uh, whether they're panelists or not. I know uh, Daniel put a, a question and an article in the in the chat. Um, but uh, Taylor, um, anything that you're uh, wanting to respond to at this point? Um, yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate um, Mary Beth. Thank you for inviting me here and. Um, it's great to meet all of you and speak with all of you and hear um, everyone's experiences and what's going on in um, different parts of the country. Um, it makes me feel hopeful to like be in these conversations and hearing um, different ideas that people have and um, hopeful for the future. Um, and I think um, if we keep um, applying pressure to our uh, city officials and um, 
you know, keep speaking out and know that we won't be silenced. I think um, we will see change and I think we're, we're making it happen. You're here. Is Gerardo still here? Yes, he is. I wanted to check in with Gerardo as well. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Yeah, hi, I'm still here. Um, what was the question? What should I comment? We're just checking in to see. I mean, I know uh, there's a number of people here who are involved with Food, food Not Bombs, for one thing. Uh, Sarah and um, Taylor that I can remember right now. And I know you are. I know you're also involved with various housing things. Just kind of get your response to what you've heard so far and what your thoughts are. All right, so everything sounds great, inspiring. Um, uh, yeah, I've been working with Fundo Bombs for the last years. We rescue food here in Royal Park in Chicago. Um, and we give it to the people. What I'm seeing right now in the north side of Chicago is um, the tents at Tui Park has been increased once again. Uh -huh. Um, and the, res the response online uh, on social networks has been horrible. So we should anticipate uh, the attack on the homeless on that front. Just yesterday, there were like 400 comments on one post in Facebook and uh, demanding the removal of the city, or the 10th city and that uh, the park should, should be safe for kids, whatever safe means. Um, the other woman, Maria Hayden, is gonna have a meeting June 17, I would like to think, or 14. Uh, I can post. I can let people wear that as soon as I confirm. Um, and those meetings are always horrible with the horrible comments of, of the people in from the part of the public and for part uh, on her part as well, right? Because she is just you know promise, promise. Uh, she is not a, she is not an ally. She is uh, claims to be a progress progressive other woman. She really is not. She just caters to the people. She wants to run for mayor at some point. So she is, you know, with the developers. And don't get me wrong, she's a friend of mine. <laughs> Before she was other woman. And, and, you know, I have her phone number and everything. Um, but she is not, she is not advocating for the well of the homeless or, or the people. She's advocating for her wellness and her, career. Um, so yeah, that's something that people in, in Chicago and in, in the, around, the, around the, the country should be aware of this war against uh, the homeless and increasingly people, when I was squatting in the house, the neighbors around me will always complain about why I'm not paying rent and why I'm not paying taxes, speaking of work and paying taxes. And that's the same argument I've been hearing about um, around uh, the tent cities in Chicago. Why do they live for free? Why do people bring their food? Why do they have to have a shower? Why do they have to have a toilet to go to? Um, so yeah, the war on the homeless, uh, especially in Tui Park, which would not bomb Royce Park, I mean, personally have been advocating for the last two years. Uh, something that I take seriously, and yeah, that's. Thank you for letting me talk. No, thank you. Um, I've definitely noticed that uh, that the encampment at uh, at um, Tui Park has increased over the last few months. So yeah, definitely something to watch. Can I rant about something that's kind of, I think I, related to this real quick? Okay, yeah, I wanted to check in with Daniel too, oh, but go you know, ahead. I'll just I'll just rant in the chat, and then y'all can, you know. <laughs> that. Okay, and then uh, we can cut, we can circle back to you. But um, Daniel, I see you have your camera on now. It's good to have you here. Um, yeah, and I I know you had uh 
shared something else from Philly. We we have comrades in Philly active on this uh, front um, that we invited to be here, but unfortunately they couldn't make it. But um, yeah, uh, what are what are you thinking about at this point in the conversation? Or if you want to share more about what you shared. No, I was just riffing, but thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, it's really kind of um, it's a little difficult actually uh, to sit into this uh, because uh, um, I haven't done any work for housing and I was, I was almost in Chicago uh, in some really multiple times in some really rough circumstances, um, but I didn't have to endure because of my, uh, my gender, my race, my class position that I was raised in, I was able to, um, I was able to uh, get in and out of the situations I was in um, and make the most of that. Um, the privilege, I mean, speaking to it. Anyway, I actually was gonna ask, I, uh, I'm in, da I'm in North Dallas, I'm in Plano actually now. And two days ago, I went to a, a food pantry here. I'm staying with, uh, friends and, uh, I was like, wow, you know, hopefully knock on wood again, like I'll be out of this situation pretty quickly. And I want to do some food, not bombs work. And I don't know anyone in Dallas. I'm not plugged in. So if anyone has comrades in Dallas in food, not bombs, uh, I would love to connect with them and try and do some work here for that. I had something else I was going to ask about and I forgot or say, uh, if, oh yeah, if anyone, I'm curious if anyone has a report or if they talked about it and I missed it, um, the attacks, the attacks that have been going on on these encampments, uh, like specifically, uh, in Avondale, I lived around the corner from that encampment. Um, and I, I was homeless, but I didn't have to live in that encampment. I had, I was able to find shelter and I, I just, I've been, I don't know, watching from a distance. It's been really hard seeing that. And I'm curious if anyone knows if any follow, obviously I, I don't trust the cops to do anything about it, but I'm curious if anything is, if anybody knows what, what has been done about that. And thanks again, Adam, for inviting me. Of course. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I don't know the latest on that. There might be folks here in Chicago who do, but you know, just generally speaking, I, I think anecdotally, I, I'm not even sure this is uh, true, um, but I think that we've seen an increase in these kinds of attacks and especially of arson over the last six years. Um, in, during the pandemic period in particular, which is really just mind boggling, um, including that one in, in Avondale. Um, and yeah, no, I just, I think it speaks to the like chaotic uh, stage of the dissolution of society and the way that um, the, the war on the poor uh, comes from on top, but it enlists some of the people with fascist or, you know, hateful or just weird backwards ideologies as well. And um, it's one of the most... Uh, just disturbing things for me or probably for any of us to see. Um, I don't know um, the latest about um, Avondale, but yeah, it was uh, an attack, an arson, um, from what I um, was told by people on the ground there. There is one point that, da that Daniel made that is really, I want to just kind of emphasize, and that is that we think of, or, or often we see in the newspapers that talk about the about the unhoused or homelessness and we think that it's only people who are living in the streets but it's not really it's much broader than that um i mean i have a a grandson who's living with us he hasn't got another place to stay uh, and that's true with a lot of other situations that people are facing around the country not just family uh, uh, but people who are uh, bunking with their friends or they have to temporarily to get over a rough patch or whatever but this is part of homelessness it's not you know this, it's not a category it's it's the very fact that uh that if i can't pay my rent today i'm going to be out in the streets tomorrow so 
it's really something that affects you know everybody that we should be thinking about there's somebody with with hand up with tech support is that rand that's rand um before we go to rand and i know we're gonna start um uh wrapping up soon oh, i yes, just want to check are. is there anyone who has not spoken yet who feels so moved to respond all right just checking thank you go ahead rand yeah, I'd just like to speak just very briefly that we need to keep our eyes on the rural uh, community, which I live in. And homelessness takes a different expression, largely relying on friends and family to couch surf, as my daughter calls it. Um, and it's not as visible. And where those that say, okay, I can't find a job and or a home in this rural area because either they're out, or out price or totally unavailable, moves to a closer city, Taylor knows one, and finds that once they get there, they can't earn enough money to house themselves. But if they were trying to commute from a rural area 34 miles out, the wages they receive don't pay for the gas. So there's it's not as clear as seeing somebody in a tent in a vacant lot or underneath the overpass, but they're as desperate as the rest of us. And largely, they're our youth, unprepared high school graduates, not prepared to be employed if there were a job offered. Thank you, Rand. Uh, I think what I'd like to do at this point We've, we have reached pretty much the end of our uh, presentations. I'd like to ask uh, Eric to close it off and uh, we'll go from there. Eric, would you please tell us a little bit about the host of this, this uh, event and where it, people can find us? Yeah, so thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, so this event was sponsored by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. And uh, what the League is, is uh, made up of people from all walks of life. We are tied together by a common aim, the end of exploitation, the public ownership of the means of production, and the distribution of the products of society according to need. The League joins other revolutionaries who challenge the ruling class on the immorality of its ruthless devastation um, of the earth and life. We trace injustice to the capitalist system and seek to show how society's problems can be solved when it is reorganized along cooperative lines. Society must be reorganized so that the abundance made possible by science and technology benefits all a society that puts humanity above profits. Um, so one thing we were thinking of, um, we're gonna send an email out about this later, but um, we were wondering if people would be interested in reconvening say quarterly to have discussions around this, uh, the housing issue. Um, and so please, you know, watch the learned.org website, it's lrna.org, uh, for information on our upcoming programs. Uh, we also have a Facebook page uh, you can follow if you'd like to stay up to date on news concerning the movement to fight back against capitalism and envision a society where all can thrive, a society where no one is ever homeless, hungry, or unable to get the health care they need. Um, so if you just search for uh, LRNA or League of Revolutionaries for a New America on Facebook, you'll find us. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions about LERNA, please message us on the Facebook page or go to lrna.org and click on contact us at the top and you'll uh, be able to send us an email. So thank you everyone. <laughs>